Welcome to Leaders of Africa Live, sponsored by the Leaders of Africa Institute. My name is Dr. Peter Pinar, and I am your host. COVID-19 has disrupted higher education, affecting professors, students, and administrators at higher educational institutions in African countries. Today's panel discussion kicks off a month of presentations, interviews, and conversations about higher education during and in the wake of COVID-19. This month-long series will produce a policy paper publication describing the COVID-19 disruptions, forms of resilience, and proposed ways to build back better. The Leaders of Africa Institute team is also conducting interviews for a short film documentary that will air at the very beginning of April. We thank you for engaging in our research and outreach journey today, and we encourage you to follow Leaders of Africa and the Leaders of Africa Institute on Facebook and LinkedIn, as well as at Leaders Africa on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, join our community for chat and networking on Discord. And of course, hit the subscribe button here on YouTube to receive all updates and future content about this series and other series from Leaders of Africa. We are grateful for a wonderful panel kickoff today. We are joined by a diverse panel of faculty, researchers, and students. Dr. Apana Singh is a senior lecturer and academic leader of the Discipline of Information Systems and Technology at the University KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Her research interests include educational technology and its ability to mobilize student learning. Dr. Godwin Debra is a lecturer and economist at the University of Ghana with an interest in improving service delivery and public safety in African countries. Welcome. Matthias Kronke is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is a graduate researcher at Afrobarometer, a nonpartisan pan-African research institution conducting public attitude surveys on democracy governance, the economy and society in 30 plus African countries. His research focuses primarily on political parties and basic service delivery in Africa. We are also joined by Caroline Musimi, who is a lecturer and curriculum designer at the Coast Institute of Technology in Kenya. And finally, we are happy to have four students joining us. Yolanda Biri is a student at Midland State University in Zimbabwe. Maria Terreri is a student at the University of Zimbabwe. And, we, and from West Africa, we have Hilary Saar and Edmund Fusu, who are students at the University of Ghana. Welcome to you all. And I want to start with the students. Um, and I want to start with you, Yolanda. And I want to hear a little bit about um, your experience at Midland State University. What, what has been the situation when uh, last year when COVID-19 struck and the pandemic uh, was continuing? What happened? Did they close down Midland State University? What happened in those early days, if you don't mind sharing? All right, thank you, Peter. Um, so for us, um, we, had to, we had a lockdown um, for about, I think, almost three months. And during that lockdown, the school, the school was still trying to figure out if we have to wait till after lockdown or if we just proceed online. So I think we then started, we then carried on with lectures about a month and a half into the lockdown. So they were a bit slow to react to the lockdown and then we started online learning. Um, we mainly use Google Teams Sorry, not Google Teams. Um, we use Google Classroom and Google Meet for video call. And from you can see the progress from last year and this year. There's been a huge difference. There's been a huge improvement now. They are now more prepared. Whereas last year when it hit, I don't think anyone was ready for it. So yeah, it was a bit of a huge compromise and a huge adjustment, which was very difficult for both students and lecturers. So now I think we are now a bit fully more prepared and online lessons are going on very, very well with a combination of the Google Classroom, notes being sent to the Google Classroom, and also as having video lessons through Google Meet. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the, the move online combined both asynchronous learning, so posting of videos as well as synchronous learning, right? Uh, learning in real time. And how did those real time sessions go? Um, were students coming to class? Were you feeling like you were being engaged in those sessions? 
we were being engaged. However, the student outcome was the one that was a bit terrible. You'd find that we had less students coming in and then they would rather opt to have the option of having the lesson or watching the recorded lesson. So mostly it's on the part of students where the students are the ones that are not attending, failure to attend probably because of um, data issues. And then they would rather opt to watch a record of the lecture. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and obviously this is what we're describing right now, Yolanda, was the beginning of the period last year of, of lockdown and the transition to online learning. I'm a little curious from you, Maria, from your perspective at the University of Zimbabwe, how was that transition for you? And, uh, you know, what are the prospects of, of opening up now? So what was that translation transition like? And, and uh, you know, are there any prospects of, of opening for some in-person learning uh, in the coming days? Um, okay, thank you. Um, well, my situation is more like the same with Yolanda. Um, at the University of Zimbabwe, we opened to in October, sometime in October last year, 2020. And as the COVID-19 pandemic progressed, we were forced to close schools and operate from home. And we were doing online lectures through Google Classroom, Zoom, um, and through WhatsApp. Well, it's been going on very well, um, but with the facing challenges of data and the internet costs are uh, very expensive. And at the same time, uh, some of some students have not been able to access online le online lessons due to data problems. However, as I said, the process has been going on very smoothly, and I'll be hoping to close school schools very soon as the lockdown and the COVID nineteen pandemic is a uh, is it's moving down. Mm -hmm. Good. So it sounds like there there was a little bit of a bumpy transition online, but it sounds pretty positive. Your your uh, views, despite some of these challenges that that were there, that were present when it came to connecting with class. And I, and I'm curious from from your perspective, uh, Dr. Deborah, what was that transition transition like at the University of Ghana? Uh, from your perspective as a as a lecturer at the University of Ghana. Hi, Peter, thanks for having me. Um, so over here at the University of Ghana, we had one student testing positive at the beginning, I think end of March or so. Those were the earlier days when Ghana recorded cases. So the university just uh, itself decided to keep students in their dormitories or in the halls. And so they made those who lived off campus to stay at home and those who lived on campus to remain on campus. Uh, but the president decided to send everyone home. And uh, here to that, I had actually moved my graduate classes online. I mean, once we recorded cases around Ivory Coast and Togo, I had personally moved my classes online um, in anticipation of that, my graduate classes. So um, when we had to go in a lockdown, uh, pretty much progress stalled. Uh, there wasn't teaching for about uh, two months. We we're trying to figure out what we were going to do. Uh, by this time, students had moved to their various homes and internet was a challenge reaching all students at the same time. Um, they could improvise with mobile phones, but not all of them had their smartphones. So it was uh, very difficult to organize online teaching in the first place, in addition to um, data costs, which are um, very, very um, exorbitant over here um, in Ghana. Um, so for about two months, uh, when we went on lockdown, we weren't, we weren't teaching at all. Uh, we had to wait until we figured out that we could um, meet students online. Somehow we had one of the telcos, Vodafone, offering free data to students. Uh, and here at the University of Ghana, we use Sakai LMS. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of zero rated. Students couldn't download stuff over there for free. So two months, we were not teaching, we were not learning. I went on lockdown, we came back and began to... Uh, and, and Peter, you realize that WhatsApp was very effective than Zoom <laughs> uh, when we went on lockdown because uh, almost every student had WhatsApp. 
mm-hmm. but they didn't have laptops to come on Zoom. Uh, most of them were hearing the Zoom for the first time uh, and, and so on. So we would, so I'm in the quantitative department statistics, which added another layer of difficulty. Uh, we couldn't really teach online. We need a whole lot of, you know, um, equipment and so on, or new iPads and so on. So we would send questions on WhatsApp. Students would try their hands and then try to type some of their answers or send pictures, yeah, of their calculations. And other students would make comments. The lecturers, professors, we were also on the WhatsApp groups, um, you know, grading assignments making comments, correcting, and so on. So that's how it was until we managed to bring the semesters to a close. So at the University of Ghana, uh, because of the earlier problem I mentioned with access to laptop, internet, and so on, we had to, um, so we improvised, we finished the the semester online, but those students who couldn't participate uh, online because of internet and computer issues, we gave them the opportunity to come back to campus when things had simmered a bit around uh, late July. They came for face-to-face interactions for three weeks after which they took the exams and then were able to catch up. So that was a transition. Uh, the situation is interesting in Ghana because for the public institutions, the authorities went, wanted us to be at par. Mm-hmm. So one of the universities dragged us back, the University of Cape Coast. They couldn't do online at all. And so even when we were done, we started to wait for them until January this year and, and so on. So, so that was pretty much um, the situation here at the Invest of Ghana. Thanks so, it sounds, so it sounds like a fair amount of improvisation that happened afterwards and the use of what it seems like a use of mobile phones was very key for both accessing lectures, some real-time interactions, and then WhatsApp conversations and, and sharing of assignments. And, I, and I'm curious, uh, uh, Dr. Debra, about um, the, the tools that were, using, that were being used before the pandemic, right? You mentioned Sakai LMS, and for those of you who right. don't know, Sakai is one of many of these learning management softwares, of which there are many of them. Canvas, maybe you're familiar with Moodle, uh, which is another open source platform. So I'm curious, before the pandemic happened, were a lot of faculty members utilizing some of these tools? Were students accustomed to using platforms such as Sakai in your view, or was it not being utilized so much by both students and faculty? Well, Peter, uh, thanks, Peter. I think um, the Sakai is pretty popular here. Uh, A lot of the faculty keep getting training in that. I must admit that not all of them are, you know, comfortable using it. So we keep having training uh, on that. Amongst the students, I think it's pretty popular. They go there for their homeworks, they know how to submit assignments and do basic stuff. So Sakai was uh, pretty much in, in full use uh, before the pandemic, which was very helpful during the transition that we could upload videos whenever we could um, and so on. So that was the main tool we were using. Um, some faculty were using the, um, the video um, aspect of that. They had a fora, they have the chat rooms students. So so before the transition, students could always send messages through the chat uh, room, asking questions, group discussions, and so on. So not throughout the campus, but um, especially the business school and so on, I'm, I'm aware that they made good use of that. So it wasn't like going from zero or nothing to online. Um, Sakai was um, uh, the tool we were using right here. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And cu- cu- building on that uh, issue of the use of, of phones in WhatsApp, Gloria in, uh, in the chat has, has uh, sort of uh, emphasized how interesting this is that uh, WhatsApp is being used. And I'm curious, Maria and Yolanda, starting with you, Yolanda, did you guys use WhatsApp for communication surrounding courses, either informally amongst your peers or for education purposes, in other words, the professor is using and the lecturer is using WhatsApp. Was did you have experience with that as well in Zimbabwe? Um, yes, we did for a certain period for a certain module. But you would find that most of our lecturers were not really comfortable using social media as they call it. Um, they consider it social media, so they were really quite reluctant on using it. They'll probably um, use um, the WhatsApp platform for updates. They'll probably update you and they'll be like. Um, probably 
update us through our class representatives and they'll be like top of the class i have updated i've uploaded notes i have uploaded videos i have sent an assignment to ensure that students get material as soon as possible so that's how what's up worked for us and they really try to avoid that they try to avoid having lectures on whatsapp so we mostly stuck strictly to google classroom and the whatsapp platform was for probably asking questions discussing with students and updates only that was basically what how we use whatsapp Wonderful. And how about you, Maria? Were you also using WhatsApp in some form or uh, communi text communication apps for learning purposes, either amongst your peers, as it sounds like, Yolanda, you, you guys were using it at, at Midland State University more for, you know, discussing amongst your peers, coordinating things. Or do you, did you find at University of Zimbabwe that also the lecturers were also using it? What was your experience, Maria? Well, um, in the case with Yolanda, um, we've been using WhatsApp quite a lot of times uh, during our studies. Sometimes we'd use WhatsApp uh, for discussions, and sometimes we'd use WhatsApp when our lecturers would want to send uh, audios and uh, other materials that we needed. WhatsApp has been used uh, mostly because um, sometimes people will not have enough data to access the classrooms and see. So WhatsApp could be the media in which almost everyone could get access to mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and Edmund, uh, I believe you're a graduate student at University of Ghana, is that correct? Oh, it's on mute. It's on mute. You're on mute, Edmund? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, please. So, so I'm curious, Edmund, from, from your perspective, what was that transition like at the University of Ghana, perhaps for, from the graduate student perspective? Um, were you also using sort of applications, chat apps to interact, or were you guys doing more synchronous learning or asynchronous learning? What was that like? And I'm, I'm particularly curious about your experience of ensuring that there's mentorship of your graduate degree throughout the process. How did that sort of play out? Okay, like, I thank you. So as my lecturer rightly said, yeah, before the pandemic, we were using Sakai LMS and then other lecturers were making good use of Zoom and, and then WhatsApp like platforms. So what happened here was that the, the postgraduates, we were not much more affected because of you know, our growth and then throughout the system in Ghana here. So this is what happened. I was a student slash uh, a junior staff, if I may put it that way, because I serve as a as a teaching assistant here. So I was involved in most of the teaching for the lectures and then all that. So I was much more particular, uh, very good in using Zoom and all that. So I was assisting uh, my graduate student how to go about Zoom and then this and that. So University of Ghana being the premier university in Ghana here, in Ghana here was the first ever school in Ghana to just take the learning uh, 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 from on-site to online. Uh, yeah, following the the, the, the the pandemic. So other schools also like follow suit. And then the university did very well in acquiring data from Vodafone Ghana here for each and every student, five gig worth of data for each, each and every student. Though that was not enough, it could save us uh, enough money. So following the, 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 the transition from, from, from on-site to online. For University of Ghana graduate students, I haven't heard anybody complaining that much because we were not much more affected because of our experience in, in the online meeting, because prior to the pandemic, like some lecturers also were doing online session with us because of our smaller class size and, and then all that. So we were much more into the online online learning than the on-site. So it was like a balance, uh, like, like a balanced thing. So the pandemic, we didn't see, 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 see the the effect that much. But then to me personally, the, 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 the effect that I, I, I really encountered was, you know, for, for some of us who have to do menial jobs and then in order for us to fund our school fees, you see that we do a uh, small teaching to get enough mm -hmm. money to save and to pay our fees. So we were, we were, we were much more uh, yeah, affected by the lockdown in terms of the financial aspect. But then in terms of the educational aspect, learning aspect, no, never. But then follow after, after the pandemic, when things became normal, now go and pay the school fees. That is where the problem is. Because a lot of the, a lot of the people that we, we, we were teaching here for small money here, 
are not into the online thing. And then because of the pandemic, no one will, will even allow you to, to get into his or her, her home to teach his or her word. And that was, and, and, and that is the most difficult thing that we face. But yeah, when things became normal, we have been able to find our way through. And then by God's grace, we've been able to pay the part that we have to register as students and then all that. And God being so great, I'm a graduate assistant here. So things are just, you know, like good now for me. So I'm okay. So Wonderful. yeah, that's it in Ghana here. Yeah. Edmund, I think that's a really uh, important point. We've been up to this point really talking about some of the immediate costs of moving online and the disruptions, right? The data costs, the access costs that are there and the challenges there. But I think you've brought up something quite interesting, which is the long-term financial ramifications of the lockdown and the ability not only to pay fees from the student side, but also on the institution side to make up from some of the shortfalls that may have been gained through the loss of, of revenue that's come in through students and through other programs that may have been offered, including including outreach programs in the community and, and study abroad programs that, that, that do bring in some money to the university. So I, I think that's an important and, and powerful thing that perhaps we haven't thought so much about in this immediate time, but the, the long-term financial ramifications. Um, I think that's imp quite important. Now, I want to turn to you, Matthias, um, because we've been talking about this issue um, a, a bit about connectivity um, and the uses of different types, forms of devices, right? And it seems like mobile phones, particularly in Ghana, have been leveraged. It sounds like in Zimbabwe, it's a combination of some mobile phones and as well as laptops and other sort of mediums for access. And you've been doing some research on public service delivery and sort of access to the the, um, the materials and, and other um, sort of connectivity uh, elements that are required to have a productive e-learning situation or that transition to online. And I'm, I'm curious, I know you're presenting on Tuesday, you'll speak more about this, but I'm curious if you could kind of preview what that looks like. What are some of the variations that you see across different African countries in terms of the access to the basic, uh, basic needs that are required for this transition to online? Thanks, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, so it's really quite interesting, and I think encouraging to hear from from our panelists how well uh, students have been able to adapt to to this situation. Um, I think where it becomes more difficult is uh, when students are not able to to have accommodation, and they have to uh, go home to their respective areas where they might not have the infrastructure necessarily. So. I mean, if we think about uh, graduate students or, or just university students in general, uh, we usually are in the top bracket of, uh, well, families are in the top bracket of, of income earners in each country. So we might be um, in a better position to, you know, have a generator at home um, or, or have access to, to internet. But even though, depending on where you go, you might just have a, a bad internet connection. And there's, um, when we uh, conduct regular surveys with, with Afrobarometer across uh, 35 plus countries, we really see on the one end, we have Mauritius, we have uh, Botswana, Ghana, South Africa, where most people really have access and a good, at least cell phone coverage. Um, but on the other end, we have countries like Malawi, uh, Mali, Liberia, where it's really not as common. And it might be fine for kind of the, the crop of, of students and especially undergrads that's, um, that's working at the moment and was at university as things started because they had some time to adjust and they had an experience of... Um, being at university while there was a face-to-face -face interaction. But it will become very difficult, I think, um, for new students who have to come in now and uh, where we have online only and they don't know it any other way. Plus, they would have been disadvantaged because their final year of high school in many cases um, was disrupted. And so I think mm -hmm. this is really when we start thinking about the transition from high school to university, this is going to be uh, very challenging, um, even just getting student registered. So here at, at UCT in, in Cape Town, South Africa, 
which I would argue is probably one of the better resourced universities in the continent, it's the first time that we're doing online only registration. Um, mm. Partly because, you know, it wasn't necessary, um, but also because we're forced to do it now. We still have a very much distant learning uh, in place. And so just transitioning the next group of students into university um, is going to be a, a, a real challenge. And if you are at home, if you don't have the, the environment, a quiet place to learn, which many just don't, um, it's going to be a really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we can expect emerging from this period um, sort of great variation across countries in terms of the longer term effects on uh, sort of the inequality that, that results from a disrupted education, right? You, you mentioned uh, some countries that have faced connectivity challenges and we can kind of assume that that has impacted learning perhaps even more than the impacts that have been there at, at more well-resourced and, and universities who have thought uh, through perhaps plans for e-learning uh, in advance. So I think that's a really uh, important uh, piece. In terms of uh, a sort of mobile phone access. What do you also find, you know, aside from the connectivity to the internet, um, is there also variation in terms of the, um, the ownership of mobile phones? And what does that look like? Since it seems like mobile phones were, the key, were one of the key instruments of connectivity during this, uh, this pandemic. Yeah, so we, we find that basic mobile phones are pretty ubiquitous across most countries. Um, but there's a real difference when we talk about smartphones and here, um, so that's, you know, being able to, to access WhatsApp, uh, Google Meets, uh, or other things. And, and again, I think this is really, uh, going to force students, um, either to, to, or even countries, it's going to force them to move to face-to-face -face interactions much faster if they cannot reach their students in another way. And that obviously has important health implications um, or that um, we find much greater differentities um, between those that that have access to this at university and those that don't so mm -hmm. you know some universities are able to send out um, even laptops to to their students on a loan basis um, but if you can't that is going to really increase the the inequality uh, in terms of access to um, to education, even within countries. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I, I just want to mention to our audience, feel free to engage in the conversation as we continue. Feel free to put your comments or questions in the chat. We will see those and we will read those aloud. And also feel free to also raise your digital hand on Zoom that can be done using the bar at the bottom where there is a reactions button. So you may raise your hands. I see there's one hand raised, which I'll, I'll get to in just a moment. But I want to bring you in, Caroline, a, a little bit um, uh, and uh, hear a little bit about the experience in, in Kenya where you are at the uh, Coast Institute of Technology. And I'm curious, are, are some of the things you're hearing uh, at the about the University of Ghana, as well as some institutions in Zimbabwe, have they been sort of similar um, sort of trends uh, in Kenya as well from your, from your position? Thank you, thank you, thank you for these opportunities. Oh. <laughs> And uh, here in, uh, in, in Kenya, the situation is um, almost the same eh? because uh, uh, the institutions were not prepared for, uh, for such a shift that has happened. So there was a closure of institutions uh, between um, March to sometimes in uh, August last year. And uh, now institutions were forced to look for means to now start first reopening, uh, to start um, uh, giving instructions online. We started using uh, WhatsApp more oftenly because uh, uh, before we used to use uh, WhatsApp like uh, to send uh, notes. So this time we could now engage students more, much more via WhatsApp. Then now uh, we started using Google Classrooms. We started using um, uh, Moodle LMS to 
reach these learners. We also try to use a big blue button. Those were some challenges because um, some of the areas could not be, are not well uh, covered or are not well uh, connected by internet. Challenges of maybe having um, uh, students or learners who come from poor backgrounds, maybe they do not have smartphones. So there were a bit of challenges and we found that some of them even dropped out from uh, learning. And now that we were preparing for exams, uh, so uh, you find that the, the exams that have been done now, the, 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 the intake was a bit low because of such challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it has Wonderful. been a, a, quite of a challenge, but uh, we are managing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a, a good word to yeah. describe a, a lot of the experiences, both on the faculty and student sides, is, uh, is uh, trying to, to manage yeah. given, the, given the circumstances. And I see that uh, Dr. Singh has uh, uh, joined us uh, here. Um, and I, I don't know if the audio is connected yet or the video is connected yet. Oh, there's the audio there. Um, and I want to ask you, Dr. Singh, We've been talking about the, the, sort of the different ways in which the pandemic influenced institutions across uh, different countries. But I know that you at the University of KwaZulu-Natal have also been observing um, how the pandemic has been influencing different institutions within South Africa itself and the variation that we see within country. And I'm curious if you could speak to what you've seen and why some institutions in South Africa have reopened faster than others. And I think Dr. Deborah was talking about this earlier about uh, some institutions being able to open earlier than others. So I'm curious if you could comment on that intra-country variation that's there. Um, thanks, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me at the session. Uh, I heard a little bit of um, Matthias speaking about disparity across countries and, you know, different types of mobile phones being used by different students. And your question is specifically looking at South Africa and, you know, how the institutions here have differed. So I want to just say from my own understanding of what happened during the pandemic, that different institutions reacted differently to the move to the online environment. So there were some institutions who were able to seamlessly transition from the face-to-face -to, -face to an online environment. And so they were able to um, complete this transition in a shorter period of time. And as a result of which academic activity started sooner and because these activities started sooner, they were able to complete their academic year within 2020 itself. Whereas there were other institutions, for example, who were completely shut down for periods of between two to three months until their staff were empowered. They were trained on how to use the technology, trained on how to um, present in terms of the online platform and so on. And also there was a limitation in terms of students having access to devices and students having access to data. So some institutions, for example, made arrangements for laptops to be distributed to their students. Um, and those who were living in rural areas were able to collect them from collection points. Other institutions had to wait until most of the students had access before they commenced with online learning. So clearly within one academic year, although we all stopped at the same point when lockdown commenced, the resumption of academic activities was varied across different provinces, across different institutions, and there are very, very many different reasons for this disparity. Mm -hmm. Good. So it sounds like there were um, very different pre sort of air levels of preparation when it came to the pandemic and schools that have had um, significant distance learning experiences or approaches tended to be a little bit more uh, successful in making that transition and opening up, keeping the school year going on a more regular um, schedule. And, and Edmund, you kind of spoke to this too about the University of Ghana and the fact that some students at the University of Ghana were a bit more prepared because they had had this online interaction with their professors that 
some of these tools will be being used. So it sounds like familiarity seemed to be a, a really key um, factor in terms of opening up and perhaps this this transition that was for all of us quite uh, quite abrupt, uh, particularly uh, on the student and and uh, professor side of, of the equation. And I want to I want to get to uh, Ghana's question here. I see your hand is raised, so I encourage you to turn on your camera if you if you're able. If not, uh, unmute yourself and and share your question with the panel as as we continue. Yeah. So thank you uh, for this very engaging conversations on this very important issue. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, uh, pertains to the use of WhatsApp. Uh, I really want to know the specific usage of uh, usage of WhatsApp. Is it that WhatsApp uh, was being used or is being used to conduct classes? Or uh, specifically, if they are using WhatsApp to disseminate information to students pertaining to issues of concerns, maybe they have some questions they want to add themselves or they want to ask their professors. I'd like to know the particular uses of WhatsApp and the challenges associated with the uses of WhatsApp. My second question pertains to the quality of education, uh, because uh, the transition from uh, uh, in class to online uh, has raised uh, significant issues of quality, even in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. So, as professors, I'd like to know from your perspective, how has this impacted the quality of education, and what are the potential implications of this for the development of the continent in terms of human? competent human capacity building. And from the student perspective, I'd like you to also tell us how uh, the quality of teaching has been negatively impacted and how you feel that may constrain, you know, uh, that might have affected what you've learned in the course of transition, you know, uh, during this online educational uh, experiment in different African countries. Thank you. you. Well, thank you, Ghana, for sharing. And again, if you'd like to have a comment or question shared, we, our sessions are very interactive, so we invite you to do that. So thank you, Ghana, for your, your, your questions and, and, and some of your commentary. Uh, I want to go to you, uh, Dr. Deborah, about um, uh, sort of this issue of how WhatsApp was used. You, you began the session talking a, a little bit about how that was used. Do you want to expand on that and, and, and perhaps also comment on, on the sort of the abilities of that platform to be leveraged, but also the significant limitations or challenges that, that, that you've seen and that you've faced and that you've heard students facing? So why don't you take that one? All right, Pira, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Ghana. It's been a while. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, so the um, let me say that um, the WhatsApp has been um, phenomenally uh, effective in organizing students over here in Ghana. My, with my experience, it works in in getting information to students. It works much better than the email system. So you can mobilize students, disseminate information in a second using WhatsApp. And Ghana, I can tell you, if you have highly motivated students, you can do anything on WhatsApp, by the way. We had, I'm, I'm in the first year, final year and graduate school. The first years were enthusiastic. Uh, that was, the, the, so the lockdown was their second semester. So they were new in their school and highly motivated to finish their first year and to move on. So these students were highly motivated and they cooperated in using WhatsApp. And I'll come to some of the specifics. And then final years were eager to graduate on time. So they were cooperative and willing to do anything to finish on time. So it was really easy for us. And I'm in the quantitative department, statistics and economics. So what do we do? So I would ha have a lecture and then tell them to the, um, introduce a topic, okay, be it whatever, Poisson, distribution, what, what, whatever it is. So I have a a real-time lecture, record it, post it online. So right after that, we move to WhatsApp to solve questions. So that's the advantage of the quantitative department. Just introduce the idea, and then we move to WhatsApp. I take a picture, send the question, they solve, we discuss. I post the question also. I remember doing a truth table, all this logical reasoning stuff, and posting there, and students asking questions, discussing, and so on. So. We weren't very much disadvantaged at, at all, yeah. And like I said, it's because they were motivated and highly interested in finishing their syllabus. So they came on time. 
even up to uh, midnight, they kept sending questions. So all the time, my colleagues and I, we were inundated with a lot of questions. So it worked for us in the quantitative department. I don't know how it may have happened or how it may have played out in you know, sociology or history or somewhere else. But for us, we, we don't read much, right? <laughs> so we introduced the topic, solve questions all day. And you're able to solve many more examples than even in the classroom, actually. In a lockdown, everybody wanted to be busy working on something. Mm. It just worked pretty well for us, uh, uh, Mr. Garner. So it was based on motivation and the students willing to finish the course uh, semester on time and to make some progress. Um, some of the challenges was that uh, sometimes we couldn't respond to them on time, but they always waited, they were patient to get the answers back. Um, later on, we got this free data from Vodafone, so that wasn't an issue anymore. Um, so those who didn't have smartphone were alienated, right? That was the, the sad part. And we couldn't bring them on board because they had no... Uh, and the good thing is these WhatsApp groups existed prior to the lockdown. So we're already organized, right? So it's, it's worked well for us. I'm, I'm going to touch on the quality bit. So here at the University of Ghana, we have reduced the syllabus, the, the content. So what we were supposed to cover. In, so by the way, the University of Ghana is doing six weeks for first years and final years. And then we go on vacation. And then the next six weeks is for second years and third years. So we have reduced the syllabus and we have increased contact hours. So I can assure you at the University of Ghana, quality has not been tampered with, um, not in a significant way to the best of my knowledge. Uh, what I'm supposed to cover in 13 weeks, I'm just doing half of that in six weeks. So it's not about superficial teaching, not at all. Contact hours have been doubled. We take our time to teach, solve examples. So I'm supposed to teach six hours a week, right? In the um, post-COVID, we taught three hours. And now I'm doing six hours. After the six hours, two hours is for recitations or tutorials. So we haven't experienced uh, um, a decline in quality at the University of Ghana at all, especially in the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. We are doing our best. We meet them. So by the way, we meet them once a week. Okay. So you watch videos, we meet once a week to discuss and to take questions and, and so on. So we haven't um, had much concern about quality um, over here. But I can imagine other places they might have um, challenges um, meeting in you know um, smaller numbers and having to meet online. Um, and, and Peter, there was one issue, you know, the, the Zoom can take 300 people maximum and for some of the subscriptions. And at the beginning, I could have more than 300 students showing up. And then that's the problem. They cannot join. Yeah. And then if you join and your internet went off, you couldn't get in back because someone else probably took your, your position uh, because we, we had a maximum of 300. Those were the challenges which... Uh, could affect quality over here. But we quickly transitioned to uh, the face-to-face on-site after the second week to forestall um, such uh, problems. So, so that's the account at the University of Ghana, Peter. So, so I think it's really interesting what you said uh, about this interaction that seemed to burgeon between professors and students. And one of the criticisms I often hear of, of professors sometimes is that they're a little bit inaccessible, right, uh, to students, right? Students find it hard to get kind of the mentorship and the, the kind of contact that you get, right? Office hours are one thing, but sometimes those office hours, some professors hold more office hours than others. And sometimes those office hours happen at times that you can't attend. End. But it sounds like there are now some new mechanisms through which uh, professors are now having this norm of interacting with students on a more regular basis and through other means that seems to have burgeoned at, at the University of Ghana, which is uh, which is really good to hear. I want to I want to build on that other aspect of quality that you touched on um, and, and go to you, Dr. Singh, about this is issue of quality. And I know you've been involved in sort of building capacity around the implementation of technology tools and the extension of, of, of sort of e-learning to support learning 
um, more broadly. And I'm curious, are there structures in place or frameworks um, that are being used to help us think about um, measuring quality of instruction in using these platforms, using certain technology tools? Uh, that's the first part. And the second part is, are, are these frameworks or rubrics being used and applied and being discussed with faculty member to help them feel capacitated, to help them improve in their practice using these tools? Thanks, Peter, for that question. Uh, quality has been of great concern in the sudden transition to online learning because many academics have just had to do it because they were forced to do it and they hadn't had much training in the whole process. So, um, most of the institutions in South Africa for the move to the online environment definitely did provide some sort of training and guidance for their academics. So the academic digital literacy was definitely in place. However, I don't think there were, for those, especially those institutions who didn't have access to online learning or weren't moving in the direction of online or blended learning prior to COVID, um, there was very little quality assurance measures in place. So what we're finding is that there are frameworks, for sure there are many frameworks that deal with quality assurance issues in online learning, but the actual implementation of these is, is pretty slow because right now the focus seems to be on the delivery of content to make mm -hmm. sure that we can reach our students, to make sure that students can complete their syllabus. Um, and it seems to be a fragmented approach to the quality assurance process of the online space. So I think that this, there's definitely scope for that to increase um, as we get more into online or perhaps post-COVID, the blended approach. I'm, I'm very excited to hear from um, Godwin that at the University of Ghana, they have already transitioned to face-to-face -to -face because we're still stuck in an environment where for the second academic year now, our entire year is planned as online. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it seems like 2020 was a practice run and 2021 is now an opportunity to correct whatever went wrong or whatever you didn't understand and experiment more in, in the online space. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges and, and thinking about doing things better is is finding the time often to reflect on on our practice and, and interrogate it and and as faculty members sometimes that can that time can be quite quite wanting <laughs> uh, when it comes to 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 dealing with that I, I want to to sort of hear from the students on this issue of quality um, that has been raised. And, and uh, starting with you, Yolanda, did you feel like professors were sort of uh, aware that perhaps the, the quality of instruction was not the same as in-person learning? In other words, were they a more uh, perhaps accommodating of student challenges or accommodating on exam papers and things of this nature? What did you find about the, the, the professor's sort of standards for the quality of your performance? Did it change? Did it adapt to the situation? And what were your thoughts on that? Um, thank you, Peter. Um, well, I would like to say that I do, funny enough, I do economics, like, um, so our department kind of had the same results or effects as we experienced the same, kind of the same things as they face at, and at the University of Ghana, as Professor God, um, Professor God Godwin said. So for us, our lecturers were actually willing to help because ours is more of a quantitative um, program. So our lecturers were actually really willing to, to help because they understand that we really need assistance, especially if you're being introduced to something new, something you haven't done before. So they were really willing to accept our questions, willing to assist in any way possible. So they made them, themselves available 24 seven. Okay, not necessarily 24 seven, but they were there. They were more available, the longer office hours. And then we wrote, I finished my final year, my first year, yes, um, last year. We wrote in-person exams. And what they did is they created a roadmap for us where we go as certain levels. So it should be first years only. And then we have face-to-face -face lectures to open open for students to discuss what where they need um, further elaboration and explanation in topics they need further elaboration in. And they basically, yeah, that's what they're doing. They give us we do online. Then before we write our exams, 
we have two weeks of face-to-face -face lectures where we have an open discussion where lectures feel like this is a hard topic, so I'll focus this, I'll focus on this, then they give us room to ask questions or further elaborations on things that we did not understand online. And then we write exams. So I feel like the quality has not produced in any way because now they are willing to, they have adapted very well to the new normal, as I would say. Mm -hmm. So Wonderful. they they offer us their services and when we then go write, we are then helped further and they explain more. If there are any questions, they assist in any way they can. So they are willing to help. So I feel like quality has brought reduced for us personally, for MOT, from my personal experience. Wonderful. Thank you, Yolanda. So we, we're, we have a, a very optimistic view from the students, uh, despite some of these disruptions. And I, I want to bring in uh, Hillary, who's here. So a couple of us have had some connection or, or video challenges, but I, I see Hillary is here, one of our students from the University of Ghana. Can you, can you hear me, Hillary? <laughs> Uh, pardon, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. All right, we can see you. So, so how has your experience been at the University of Ghana? Have you have you also similarly found that the quality of the education hasn't changed so much, or do you think there have been some changes, right, in these these different adaptations to the schedule? What what have you found? Well, for me particularly, I like the online because and even when we were going for classes in person, my friends and I would usually record the classes so that we can go back and listen to what the lecturer sort of said. So with the online, the online classes were recorded and so you could go back to it any time to sort of look at it and at any time that you wanted. And so I felt like that was, that helped me a lot because it was already recorded. And at any time I could see what the lecturer was doing. Whereas if we were doing it in person, after you left the class, you didn't know, you would have to maybe sort of ask a friend, what did le the lecturer say? I mean, concerning a particular topic. So I like the online a lot. And in the University of Ghana, we were already used to the online. We're used to, we're used to it already. So it wasn't, so much we didn't have we didn't face so much difficulty because we're already using sakai a lot mm -hmm. so the only problem was with um you know the internet and everything and when we sort of have to take tests on sakai and everybody is on sakai at that same particular time taking the test there will sort of be like a jam or something and that was just mm -hmm. the problem that we faced but concerning the quality i think it was okay mm -hmm. i like it i like the online yeah and I'm 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 one I'm curious, Hillary, uh, whether the the University of Ghana reached out to you uh, and sh and asked you to share your experience. So one of the things that we talk about um, in improving education is hearing student voices and getting giving feedback to their professors. Did University of Ghana have a framework for hearing from students about some of their challenges as well as as you just mentioned yes, some yes, of the yes. positive things? And how did that play out? Okay, so the students' body, such as the SRC, because we were in groups on WhatsApp, they would usually ask us if we were okay, how like how the online is going for us, like we should rate it, we should see how everybody's sort of doing in terms of the online education. So WhatsApp actually was where would everybody would share their views on how the online classes were was going. So, yeah. Wonderful. Good. So there, there was some some feedback mechanism that was that was in place, which is really important. I'm trying to see if Dr. Rufai is uh, here. It seems like he has had some internet connectivity difficulties throughout. So hopefully um, that gets fixed uh, as we uh, enter in our last few minutes of our discussion. But I want to come to you, Matthias, on 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 this question that has been raised. Um, I'm seeing that uh, a microphone is on here. Let me. Okay, there we go. 
So I, I want to come to you about um, something that is underlying perhaps some of these decisions to open up, right? We've talked about institutions making decisions about opening up um, based on their capacity, based on sort of their desire to interact with students using e-learning platforms. But we know that the government is also engaging in, in policy making decisions that affect in particular public universities, but in some countries, private universities as well. And so I, I want to hear from you a little bit more, perhaps just, just from the South African experience, but if you can talk about other experiences, that, that's fine. But I'm, I'm curious about the South African experience. You know, what is the direction that government is giving when it comes to, you know, this, the plans for reopening? And when it comes to the inequality that you, that you alluded to before that will emerge from this, what are some of the signals that governments are giving about how they're going to deal with the inequities that may result from this, uh, this pandemic period? Yeah, thanks. So I think it's, it's really tricky um, precisely because we have uh, the apartheid uh, past and there are huge differences between the different institutions and Professor Singh alluded to, to some of this already that some institutions were able to transition fairly smoothly and, and send out um, these laptops and luckily UCT was, was one of them but for others it's really difficult and I think government is trying to, to do their best um, also in terms of financial aid to, to kind of cushion the transition and, and help students out. Um, but I think in terms of implementation, it's just really, really difficult. Um, and there's so many competing, competing aspects to it. So, and I mean, on the one hand, we have uh, uh, high education students who certainly need the support, but we have currently an unemployment rate that's sitting at well above 50 percent probably um i mean it's difficult to to gauge the numbers and so where do you allocate the resources um and i would even make a case of saying maybe higher education is not is not a priority in, com in comparative perspective um so i think that that is a really tricky bit not to say that that these inequalities aren't there among higher students of higher education, but it's always compared against what, mm -hmm. um, and that's it, where it's really tough to to make these calls as government. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, important because obviously our session today is all about uh, thinking about higher the impacts on higher education, but the impacts have been broadly felt across educational sec the the entire educational sector. And as you mentioned, Matthias, earlier, we have to think about the incoming classes, the incoming freshman class in, in the future, what that's going to look like uh, in regards to disrupted learning. And because a lot of the things we've been talking about today, it sounds like uh, a lot of university students have been able to be a bit flexible, a bit able to adapt. But of course, younger folks are not able to adapt or not, perhaps not as motivated as you mentioned, Godwin, earlier to, to graduate, so to speak, um, and to sort of buy into some of these, these processes taking place. So I think that point is well taken, Matthias, that when it comes to thinking about resources and dealing with the, the broader base in inequities that may uh, that have resulted from the pandemic, that perhaps those uh, those resources will be allocated and should be allocated uh, at more in a more foundational level in the education system. So I think that's uh, uh, I think that's quite important and arguably very important to us in higher education as well, because we also want uh, very competent classes that are coming in uh, to begin their studies as well. So it it it, it, it plays that role. Um, in addition. So I see Hashim has his hand up here. So I want to go to you so uh, to get your question in there. If so, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. Yes, hello. Hi, we can hear you, Hashim. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm a labor handler student at the University of Ghana, and then I just wanted to emphasize on the quality of education. Uh, my lecture, Dr. Godwin Debra, talked about. Uh, I want to just say, in University of Ghana here, the quality of education has not been compromised, even though with the uh, online session. Uh, when I had admission to University of Ghana, I was uh, offered economics, mathematics, statistics, and I was wondering how I was going to, I mean, cope with mathematics because, you know, it involves a lot of uh, ambiguous diagrams and formulas. 
But one of the tools the schools resulted was uh, the use of the SACA LMS, my lecture machine, and then he forgot to mention of a Google Classroom. And I think with this Google Classroom, it made uh, the teaching and then learning of mathematics very easy for both teachers and students here. I remember in every week, we, we have a, a tutorial class on the Google Classroom where the lecturer puts questions and then we discuss. I mean, it's very interesting that uh, with the Google Classroom, Classroom, we are able to easily ask the lecture question and then feedback is given very e easily. And sometimes I think we just feel like it's a face to face lecture and not a, an online lecture. So I think in University of Ghana, yeah, quality has not been compromised. That's what I just wanted to share. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hashim. So another sort of positive assessment from the students on, on, on quality. And of course, when, we, when we're studying quality and we're thinking about it, um, we, we know that there are a, a lot of different experiences around quality, but it sounds like overall things have been uh, quite posit positive overall. But we do have a, qu a good question from Isaac in the chat um, about, uh, the po of, about asynchronous learning. Right, asynchronous learning. For those of you who who haven't uh, sort of focused on this or, or don't know, asynchronous learning is where you don't have live sessions like our live session today. Instead, you post re, uh, materials, you post videos online for students to access. They take uh, sort of small quizzes and, and exams online, and they work through a course. Um, sometimes self-paced, sometimes we drip content. So the content is released on a, on a scheduled basis. And one of the things that Isaac mentions is that some, he su suggests that some lectures have been sort of pre-recording using asynchronous approaches, and it has made it very difficult uh, for, um, uh, for students to ask questions, right? To have that interaction that's there. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious from your uh, perspective, uh, Dr. Singh, this, this debate that we all have oftentimes about asynchronous versus synchronous learning. Um, are there ways of perhaps dealing with some of the challenges that Isaac identifies of this, this, uh, this difficulty interacting with one's professor in a more asynchronous environment, as we know that some professors have, have elected to use that, that approach? Hey, um, thanks for that question, Peter, and thank you. I think it's Isaac who's posed to that question. Um, before I, I even respond to that, I would like to say to Prof. Gautam, congratulations. It seems that the University of Ghana has really done a good <laughs> job. Um, the students are really positive about their experience, and it's probably a very good role model for most of us in Africa um, because you know not many students have, have positive experiences of the move to online, especially if they're registered at face-to-face -face institutions like ours. So the concept of asynchronous learning, um, you know, traditionally, it depends on what type of institution the student was registered at. So if, for example, they registered at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, they have made a conscious choice. Okay, I would say prior to, to 2021, the student had made a conscious choice of coming to a face-to-face -face institution because they wanted that interaction with the lecturer. They wanted to attend lectures. They wanted to be able to interact with other students rather than going to a distance-based learning institute or an online learning institute. So because there was this conscious decision and because we had to, to move or we were forced to move to the online environment in 2020, I think it's absolutely essential that academics understand that we have different types of learners in the classroom so that learning style um, spectrum also comes into play here. And you have to cater for those students who want that interaction. So whether it is via a live lecture or whether you choose to record your lecture sessions and put them up for the students on the learning management system, you still need to provide that interactive time with the students. Whether you set up a meeting, a Zoom meeting once a week for students to come in with queries just for you know, a typical consultation, or whether like Prof Godwin spoke about using WhatsApp so that students can interact with you, there has to be some form of communication where the student has the ability to interact with you in a live environment Mm -hmm. using the technology. 
And I think it's, it is important, unless, of course, you had specifically said that this module is asynchronous. So the student knows that they're signing up for no interaction, except via emails or you know, asynchronous medium. And within a synchronous classroom as well. So if you're having a live session, it's important for you to vary the activities that you have with the students in this live session. So you shouldn't simply deliver a three hour lecture and expect students to interact and engage. It doesn't work like that mm -hmm. in the online environment. Mm -hmm. As much as it doesn't work well in a face-to-face -face environment, it's even worse in the online environment. So you need to break it up with activities, for example, where you have breakaway discussion groups, or as the student said earlier, where they had discussions with the lecturer, um, or you have a discussion forum or a quick poll here and there. So having various activities during that synchronous session as well encourages students to attend because they, they realize it's not just about content delivery, but it's about engaging for learning from their fellow students and to have the social interaction which they're missing in the you know, face-to-face -face environment. So that was a bit of a ramble, but I hope it answered your question. <laughs> no, no, I think it, I think it did. Um, and I think there are a lot of misconceptions oftentimes about it, what asynchronous uh, teaching style is about, right? Um, and, it, and, it, and I think one of the key things you underlined is that it is, it is very important to be upfront about the, the kind of style that is being used so that when students enroll, they know and have expectations for what that looks like. And, and oftentimes those expectations shouldn't just come from the professor themselves, arguably, but also the institution that allows students to know this is what a class will look like if the professor chooses to have asynchronous learning. So I think that was quite important. And the, the other piece there is that asynchronous learning also has a an interactive component with the professor that has to be there. And, and I think uh, we have to think about ways in which we, we build that into those, uh, those, those approaches. So I thank you, Isaac, for, for, your, for your question there. Uh, Caroline, I want to come to you um, about um, the, the issue of of exams and assessments. Um, and this is something that always see, tends to come up uh, in sessions when we think about e-learning, is that many countries have standardized exams or institutions have standardized exams, right? And that, uh, and some of those exams are, are established by the country themselves. Like there are, there are certain curriculum standards and you must design an exam that reflects those curriculum standards. And we all know that there have been challenges around exam integrity and assessment integrity before the pandemic, right? That has always been a concern of professors uh, and institutions before. And now we're in this online uh, e-learning environment or hybrid environment. How does one think about delivering I exams or assessments? How have you sort of counseled others to think about um, um, you know, measuring learning in a way that we can really gauge the learning impact and also that we can um, assess whether a student has met our standards, our quality standards. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, here in Kenya, not most of the institutions were able to do the exams online, but uh, just a few like um, uh, uh, the national universities like uh, University of Nairobi, and a private university known as uh, Mount Kenya University were able to run their examinations successfully uh, uh, online and they were able to record and um, the exams were, were okay. However, for our case in, uh, in my institution, we, we taught online and then we had to call our students back to sit for the exams because our students sit for a national exam, which is, um, mm a standardized exam all over the country. So we could not uh, do it um, via online. So we had to call them uh, and they did the exams in shifts. So they already did the exams in the last, um, in the last month, that is uh, starting the month of January and um, to up to mid uh, this month. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the exams were done face to face. Mm -hmm. But some institutions managed to give the exams online, though there, there were some uh, issues of cheating. So uh, I think uh, we are yet to, to, to a place where we could say that we can uh, be able to administer our exams online and uh, we get quality results or uh, 
we, we'll be able to say that we examined our learners uh, and um, we did our best. So mm -hmm. we are yet to get there as a country. And I think that's a, an important point. Uh, it sounded like exams were very important in Kenya such that they, uh, by and large, had students come in and take them so they can at least sort of control that exam taking environment. I hear of other institutions perhaps considering a move away from types of exam, exam forms of assessment, right? Relying mm -hmm. on essays and other sort of end of semester projects to to round out. But we know that in big classes and, and uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Deborah, you mentioned, you alluded to the size of some of your classes by mentioning the Zoom limit on some plans of being 300. We know that a, a class of 300 plus or or even 100 plus um, is quite large, right? And and to be able to have alternative assessments um, can, be, can, can be quite difficult. So I, I wanna hear from your perspective, Edmund, about exams and assessments. Um, because you've been sort of uh, uh, assume I assume you've also been involved in administering exams or dealing with exams as a as a uh, teaching assistant, um, but also engaging in that pro process yourself as a student. So what does that look like, and what have been some of your observations about the delivery of assessments? Oh, you're on mute, Edmund. Oh, okay, all right. Thanks. So for here in the University of Ghana, I think. Uh, the quality of assessment is 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 is, is not tampered with, if 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 I may say. So, for my for my second year, uh, as in for my second semester, first year I encountered you know practical questions when we went home and then we were doing the online section. So all the questions that we were given was purely practical. A question in probability theory like construct a probability a, a, a multivariate probability model to 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 model the COVID-19 data in Ghana, and then based on that based on that model, how is sample pooling possible for what Noguchi Memorial Institute in the University of Ghana? So with such a question, how are you going to even copy your friend and then and then it is about building your own model, speaking to it, and then after speaking to it, you know, like like show us your 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 understanding of the model. So it was purely practical, and even after the practicality of the questions too. You you have to upload your 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 your, your assessment through Sakai, and then it will pass through a, a, a software called Tenetin, where the plagiarism is being checked. So for University of Ghana, I think one way or the other, they were much more prepared when it comes to assessing a, 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 a student here. So for me, for me, for instance, I encountered difficult and practical questions as compared to the first year. Uh, first semester that I was writing exam uh, uh, on site. For the on site, I think things were very easy for me because they consider the fact that you come to class and then come and write it. So the questions were 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 were, were standard. But when it go to the online to prevent cheating and then all that, they made the questions so practical that you have no idea than to do it on your own and then submit it even through anything for plagiarism to also check for you. So for the plagiarism policy, it should be less than twenty percent here in the University of Ghana. So if you go online and then and then uh, uh, the work that you submitted is flagging a color green, then it means that you are successful. You are successful in the first stage of assessment. That is, you have passed the plagiarism. Uh, 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 for the plagiarism part, you have passed. Then it, then it is now for the professor or for the lecturer to assess what you have written over there. Is it meaningful for a grade A, a grade B, a grade C? But then once your plagiarism is being flagged, maybe red, then it means that you have, you are in the process of failing. You, yeah, you are in the process of failing because in the first time you've, you've already failed. Yes, but then let the lecturer go and look at what you are writing. Is it the same as what somebody has presented? Because I know people, I know people who are in level, I think 300, 400 in the math department who are being failed because they presented the same work. Interneting could capture it. Yeah, where to where? Interneting could capture it. So for me, for me, for instance, I encountered difficult questions, and I, 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 I much more appreciated it because I was solving practical questions in the field of statistics as compared to the previous one that I go to class, uh, find the expectation of this, and then all that. So I was much more exposed to practical questions. So that's the assessment over here in the University of Ghana for we the graduate student and then that of the undergrads. Yeah. 
That's, that's a really interesting assessment because um, one of the criticisms you hear from some students, um, particularly some students that study abroad uh, who have had their undergraduate experience, um, uh, they, they come abroad and they say, what, what, the way that we've been trained is mainly to kind of recall information, you know, listen to information, write it down verbatim, and then put it onto exam and, and sort of go through that process. But it sounds like um, from your experience and your sort of analysis of exams is that exams have been asking for some higher order thinking perhaps, right? Moving beyond this sort of memorization to applied situations, right? And perhaps that's a really interesting adaptation, right? In the context, as you said, to prevent cheating, to prevent sort of simply <laughs> copying and cutting and pasting, but to have a bit more applied types of assessments. That's a really interesting innovation that came, uh, it seems that came out of, of this period. Period. And I'm curious, Yolanda, have you also seen the same? Have professors changed the, the nature of the sort of the assessments, the exam questions, the, the ways in which they're, they're figuring out whether you know material or, or has your experience at Midland State University been pretty much the same as it was before? I'm curious to know. Okay, thank you, Tita. So um, for us, it's always been the same because for exams, it's definitely application. You need to apply what you've been learning. So you will know, you'll find out that whatever concept that you're learning from, whether is it a mathematical problem, you always have economic application. You always have questions with an economic application that require you to use economic application. So for our exams, it's always, it always has to be questions to do with economic application. And yes, I, I do have to agree with Edmund that the exams were quite difficult or, quite, or a bit more challenging than the exams we did first because I think they feel like we've had more time to study, to research, to discuss, and teachers have been putting a lot more effort, so they require us to have a lot more knowledge and do better. So exams definitely have been more challenging, I would have to agree there. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Yeah. So there's always uh, assumptions that professors make about time. Um, and even for myself as a professor, uh, going into last semester, I kind of assumed my students would have a little bit more time because the campus had all of these restrictions on what they could and couldn't do. So what else could you do than read uh, uh, several articles in a week <laughs> and be prepared to discuss? So uh, I think that's a, an interesting observation from, from your perspective about, uh, you know, how, how professors are sort of thinking about the use of time, but also kind of adapting to, to the context. So I think that's uh, wonderful. I was going to get Maria in, but it seems like she got uh, uh, disconnected. Oh, no, she's there, but her um, her sound may be having an, um, an issue. I'm always keeping an eye on, on this. All right, there you are. Maria, can you hear us? Hi, Maria, yes, can, can you hear you. us? Yes, I can do. Okay. So how was your experience at University of Zimbabwe? Was it similar to your, 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 uh, your, your colleagues there at the Midland State University in terms of assessments? Well, um, I think I'm a first year student who just began uh, her education at the University of Zimbabwe in 2020 last year. Well, my experience hasn't been much of, um, I haven't had much of campus experience. I think I've been doing uh I think I've been doing online le lectures uh since since November. I only attended lectures uh on campus in the month of October. Therefore, so um the quality of education that has been offered by the University of Zimbabwe since I've been uh since I've enrolled, I can read it um I can read it a seven out of ten in terms of academic excellence. But then in terms of uh, the experience I've had with my peers and staff members and everyone else uh, with whom I, I should have uh, had experiences at university, I think uh, I haven't had much of an experience in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I... I I, I want to I want to turn I guess in our last a couple minutes together because um, we're going to close the session very shortly. So if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. I see Danny has shared 
uh, 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 sort of emphasize and, and like that point about how students are perceiving and how professors are perceiving the amount of time that we have. So please put your questions and comments in the chat. I'll make sure to read those at, at our very end. But as we come to a close, we also know that the disruptions in higher education not only influence teaching and learning, um, which is what we've spent a lot of our time talking about, but it has also influenced um, the, the production of research and the opportunities to be able to uh, engage in collaborations and, and research collaborations, particularly those that have a, um, an in-person element that is quite critical. And so I wanna hear from a, a little bit from our faculty members and, and researchers, you know, how their experience has been adapting to that, whether there've been sort of new opportunities or whether it's, it's made things a bit challenging. So Matthias, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of your experiences in that area? How has this, this period influenced your, your research? Sure, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been a, a plus and uh, a, a drawback. Um, I think on, it has really made um, online or virtual conferences a lot more acceptable. And so we were able to, to put together a, a pretty good conference uh, on political parties, for example, basically at no cost with people from around the world that otherwise, I don't think people would have signed up for it um, because they're too busy. But now it, it became one of these few instances where people were so um, enthusiastic to talk about what they have been working on by themselves also all this time. So that was a, a, a big plus side. Um, on the other hand, in terms of collecting primary data, I think it's been really, really difficult and required a lot of shifting of, of plans. Um, so for Afrobarometer, for example, um, we had to hold field work because we, we did not want to endanger um, citizens that we would ordinary, um, ordinarily um, interview. And only months, I think in, in November, we started with the first kind of, or October, November, we started with the first interviews again. Um, but now also collecting phone numbers so that we can start um, interviewing people via telephone as follow-up interviews. So it it helped to innovate and i think that is really the the big takeaway is it forced people to innovate at a rate that they otherwise would not have done um but it also makes it a lot more difficult and certain things are simply impossible to do right now and i think if we if we focus on the things that we can change or we can innovate and accept that we have to put pause on, on certain things um I think we could at least make the the most of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, I think that's well said, and I think what's really nice about our session today and the foregoing month long series is that it becomes really easy when people are accustomed to using this medium. It l lowers the cost of of a, a quote unquote international gathering and 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 it, and the the fruits of, and the beginnings of an international collaboration as well. So Dr. Singh, how about for yourself? How has it influenced uh, some of your research project pr uh, practice? Obviously you also research in the areas of the use of technology and education as well. So I'm, I'm curious uh, how, that, uh, how this period has, has influenced you and in, in some of the research that you're doing. Thanks, Peter. Um, like Matthew has said, I think that the entire transition to the online space has um, revolutionized the way in which conferences are now offered. So uh, where, you, where it was frowned upon to participate virtually, it's now become the norm. And so we, there have been a lot more opportunities to participate in international conferences, international webinars, like you know, this kind of platform. So for me, the collaboration has really increased during uh, the pandemic rather than decreased. However, the writer did suffer initially because there was more focus on trying to get your courses together, you know, quality courses, moving them to the online environment. And then, of course, as I said, particularly at the University of Queensland, Natal, there was this whole series of trying to empower academics and, you know, training that was going on intensively. So that, that was difficult. The second thing I found is that there was a flurry of um, researchers wanting to cover topics related to COVID-19. So because there was no prior, you know, uh, or there were no prior topics on COVID-19, uh, research done 
uh, based on the pandemic, everybody was trying to get questionnaires together to get feedback from academics, feedback from students, feedback from management. And so there, were, there seemed to have been too many surveys which were distributed in too short a time and participants mm -hmm. were then getting you know, survey fatigue and you were not getting people participating no matter how many times you asked them to participate. So that was one of the major obstacles I found in terms of research and data collection. And the other one is, you know, we have strict ethical clearance procedures at our institution. And without people working in the office, it's very hard to pin somebody down to say, how far has my application gone? Or when can I expect to get feedback? So you're chasing behind getting that ethical clearance and you're losing time because it's a current topic and you need to get your survey out before somebody else covers that topic. So it was this racing game that you were playing all the time. But nevertheless, we have done some research and you know the research cycle, as you know, takes a long time. So we're starting to see acceptances of those papers coming in this year, where we would, would have liked to have seen them coming in last year because it was fresh and it was hot off the press. But we'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so we're going to be reading, I can assume, in journals uh, about things related to COVID-19 for, for, for the foreseeable future, right? Across, across all disciplines. I think that's one of the, the commonalities. We're all coming from diff different disciplines, uh, myself and Matthias in political science, yourself in, in uh, information, as well as uh, um, ed education, and then uh, uh, Professor Deborah in, in economics. We're all going to be reading about the effects of COVID-19, and students are going to be seeing this case studies, but we will we'll all feel even much older when we are talking about COVID-19 in the students where, uh, where this was a remote memory in, in their minds. So that we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll cross that road when that, when, when that comes. <laughs> uh, so lastly to you, Professor uh, uh, da, uh, Deborah, um, to how has it influenced your research? Um, we see some uh, discussion of opportunities uh, in research, but also some um, serious constraints and, and particularly those surrounding, you know, in-person um, types of research where there are health considerations that are present. So, so what does it look like from, from your position? Absolutely, Peter. Um, with the system we have at the University of Ghana right now, I think some time has been freed up for us to do research. Like I said, we are doing six weeks right now and then we go on vacation and another badge of 200s and 300s come in. So the, for myself, if I don't teach level 200s, I get some time off to do research. So um, definitely there is some time now than I would have had if there wasn't this uh, style of teaching. So sometimes I've been freed up uh, for research, does that. Um, but once school is in session, you don't have much time at all because it's more intense and not to meet students almost every now and then answering questions and so on. So you just have to strategize properly. Uh, my style is to, let's say when we are on lockdown, we are not teaching, I put the research ideas together. And then when we come back, you can begin to do the computer aspect of using your software and so on. But it's really hard to uh, conceive ideas during this time when you are teaching or to initiate or bridge um, mm -hmm. new research ideas. Those are very difficult when school, when school is in session. So I seize the opportunity during the break or lockdown to put stuff together, which I'm now working on. So I haven't um, really been affected much that, and I'm making um, tremendous progress this year uh, with research. Pertaining to survey, we are in statistics department, so we do a lot of surveys and so on. That has been affected, you cannot. Actually, we, we don't want to be receiving papers, right? We don't want to touch papers or things from other people. So we are not administering um, uh, PAPI, the paper step, you know, the paper form of, uh, of survey. Uh, we are moving to online and so on. So our students are not much affected, again, because of WhatsApp, we can create the survey online and then dispatch through WhatsApp. So that hasn't been affected much. Those who have to go to the field, they have been affected um, mm -hmm. quite well. And uh, we hope things get better so that uh, uh, we all move back to normal. Yeah, you mentioned one thing about this, this issue of more time. 
And I know at a lot of institutions, they had delayed openings and uh, condensed schedules. Um, and I think it provided a little bit more time and space, perhaps, perhaps difficult situation to get motivated to write and to, to do research, but a little bit more time to do research um, that is there. Of course, all things considered, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Singh, the upfront costs of designing, redesigning, and sort of rethinking your courses, right? That, that, that down payment uh, that, you, that we've all had to put on uh, to get things up and running. So it seems like a, a, a similar, similar theme across of our, uh, our institutions and our contexts. And so we're up against time. I, I see that Derek has mentioned that in Kenya, um, online classes um, were, uh, were new this year. Exams, though, were standard, coming back to what Carolyn mentioned earlier about how they had ways of sitting for in-person exams at, at a, in a staggered way, um, and that he also hopes the, the best in the near future. And so as we conclude, um, I would just want to go around uh, for all of us uh, and share one thing that we really want to uh, keep. Let's focus on keep as opposed to drop from this era. Uh, one thing that we would uh, sort of preferably like to keep or what we sort of learned or what, one thing that was good perhaps about this era, one thing that we, that we want to keep moving forward uh, God willing, after the uh, pandemic ends. So I want to start with uh, with you, Maria. What is one thing you'd like the University of Zimbabwe and your experience to to keep after the pandemic period? Well, after the pandemic period, uh, if there's one thing I'd like to invest in, to keep uh, online lectures. I uh, figured that when, um, when you're on campus, Yes, we'll be having face-to-face -face interactions with others. But online lectures to uh, an important sector in our ac academic life and uh, the technological changes as the world is progressing. I think that online lectures help us students, uh, especially on the side of students who are entrepreneurs or students who, um, who go to school at the same time, they do work uh, to get some money. I think online lectures do help them to juggle between the two, between going to school and at the same time uh, managing their business or whatever they'll be doing, which is not academic, but rather what improves their lives. So therefore, online lectures uh, are quite effective and are, and are an important aspect of our, uh, of, our academic, uh, of our academic life. So I believe that um, online lectures should keep on uh, being, being done at university. Okay, we're going to keep online lectures in some form. Good. Um, how about yourself, Yolanda? Uh, what, 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 what is one thing you'd like to keep? Thank you, Peter. So I feel like the recording of lectures should be kept because I can always then turn back to that whenever I don't understand a concept or whenever I need to revisit a concept because I'm someone who works with visuals. So definitely recording of lectures should definitely be kept. That, that's the plus. And also um, the availability of lecturers. You'll find that they are more willing to help and assist when they are online than it was. So it's not like they're more available. They have more hours to help us. So I feel like that should also, that should be an element that should be kept. Not that they weren't doing it before. They were, but now it's more, it's more welcoming, I guess. So I feel like that's another, that's another aspect that should be kept. Okay, good. So keep up that uh, interaction and all of a, a note to all of us faculty, we better look really nice and, and prepare uh, to learn how to speak very well in front of cameras or, or know that our students are recording them and, and uh, perform accordingly. So that's one of the things that we'll, we'll have to keep in the back of our minds. Uh, that, that's, that's come up in our conversation. That's lovely. Thank you, Yolanda. Carolyn, what's one thing that uh, uh, you would like to keep, Carolyn? It's on mute. Now is the oh. audio not? Oh, there we go. Sorry for that. I thought I was on mute. Okay, uh, I've really enjoyed um, recording my classes during this period of COVID because you can always, the, the, the students can always get back to everything that you taught uh to even the mood of the classroom during that period so uh i think this is something that we should learn to keep 
in uh, in the future, even uh, in, during post-COVID uh, times, that uh, we can always record our our lessons for future use, or maybe if uh, a trainee was not able, or a, a student was not able to attend a lesson, they can be able to catch up later uh, once they, they, they watch those uh, recordings. And also, we should also uh, keep the online uh, learning uh, for, for, for the case of when we have so many students, so many learners, and uh, maybe you're not able to keep them in a classroom, so you can be able to reach them wherever they are, or maybe they're just within the, 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 the premises of, uh, or the institution, but uh, you do not have large classrooms, eh? mm -hmm. because in the near future, we're going to have a boom of these students because of uh, the COVID-19 um, effects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so Caroline's on board with recording lectures. That's good, that's good. Hillary, how about yourself? What would you like to keep? See if there's any connections she can hear us. All right, so let's move on. Um, Edmund, what's one thing that you would want to keep? Yeah, so for me, in summary, I think uh, the practicality of uh, our questions uh, yeah, should be kept here in the University of Ghana because it's really, uh, it is really an advantage as a statistics student, you know, to be, yeah, to be given practical questions in, in an IE or in an exam. Yeah, because it will, it will greatly influence your, your master's or your PhD thesis. So I think the practicality of the questions whether in necessary form in an IA in an exam should be kept. Okay, after right. pandemic, yeah. I, I would have to agree with you. Keep those questions of applied and keep them asking students to apply their knowledge at, at, at high, in higher order thinking. I, I really love that. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's quite important. Hillary, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, wonderful, we can see you now. So what is one thing you'd like to keep? So one thing I'd like us to keep is the online class and possibly improve upon it in a sense that we properly educate ourselves on online classes and provide the necessary resources needed for it. Because just as the COVID hit and we had to move to the online system, anything could happen. So if we are abreast and if we know how to use it properly, we would be able to, I mean, going forward, it will be easier for everyone, every student. So that's mm -hmm. one thing I'd like us to keep. All right, keep the online classes, but some professional development surrounding them mm -hmm. to, to keep improving um, the quality there. Let's, let's now turn to, uh, to, to uh, the faculty now uh, and researchers. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see, what, do you, what would you like to keep, Matthias? What's one thing? Um, yes, yeah, so I think the the opportunity to collaborate across um, institutions, countries. I mean, just the fact that that all of us on the call are able to to talk on the same topic um, would not have been possible, or, or the incentive to do so would have been much lower uh, just a year ago. Um, and I think that is both positive for researchers. Um, for conferences, but also for students. So to get guest lecturers, um, to combine lectures across institutions, I think they hu there's huge untapped potential here. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. So the ability to collaborate internationally at low cost. I like the, men the mention of bringing in guest lectures um, because it, oftentimes universities or professors have to coordinate travel schedules, honorariums, a lot of things that go into bringing together a panel or even just one guest speaker to campus. This becomes a, a, a much more accessible, easier option to, to do um, and, and, prop, and equally rewarding. Wonderful. Um, uh, Dr. Singh, what, uh, what do you think we should keep? Uh, for me personally, I would like to keep the flexibility of being able to work from home. I think I've been able to achieve a lot more. Um, and it's not because I live far from the campus and I have a lot of travel time. 
but it's just you're able to make use of your time more productively. Yeah. Um, so that that for me has been a, a great bonus of being able to, you know, a complete to complete more tasks within within the the normal office time that you would typically have. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That commute from from bedroom to your uh, to your home desk is a is a very short one. Um, and I think uh, myself doing a bit of hybrid teaching, I realize the added time it takes for me to get myself to campus to set up the equipment to get everything ready in a classroom comparison to what I'll be doing in just a few minutes after our session today, just flipping on things and, and beginning to lecture online. So there is some uh, uh, convenience to working at home uh, that, that we have in that, that much shorter commute. Um, wonderful. And lastly to you, uh, uh, Professor Deborah, what is one thing that you would want to keep? Hi, Peter. Um, I agree with your students. Uh, putting recordings uh, on Sakai is usually very helpful. So I would like to keep that. And also because of this, we don't have much pressure on student accommodation. So here at the University of Ghana, there's challenge getting accommodation for students. So this online thing has uh, uh, watered down the pressures uh, a bit. Um, I'm just hoping the university will find clever ways of leveraging a hybrid system, which can help you know, uh, with the accommodation problem. It's really a big issue on campus and many students get stranded. And so I would want them to keep a hybrid system because it has helped us to reduce the pressures on accommodation on campus, pretty much. Thank Wonderful. you. Good, thank you so much. And we've, we've got a lot of things we wanna keep, but we could spend a lot of time talking about the things that we'd rather forget about or, or, or not take with us as well. Of course, we're gonna end on a positive note. And I, I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, to you um, and also the, the couple of panelists that have found it difficult to connect. That's a reality we have to contend with. And, and we have certainly done so today, as well as the background noises and other distractions that happen we, when we're in our different environments. That's also a, a, a certain uh, um, sort of a, a thing that we will remember from this period and, and connecting in this way. But I wanna thank you all, in particular, the, our students who have joined us, uh, Hillary, Maria, uh, Yolanda, um, thank you, and as well as Edmund as well, who is playing the role as both student and uh, teaching assistant on the teaching side. So thank you so much for sharing your, your perspectives. And I also wanna uh, thank our, our faculty and researchers, uh, Matthias, uh, Dr. Singh, uh, Dr. Deborah, for joining us and engaging, and also Dr. Uh, Rufai, who unfortunately found it difficult to connect to today's session because of internet uh, connectivity issues, which is something, as we, we mentioned, we always have to contend with. So I wanna thank you all for engaging in this conversation. And I also wanna thank um, everyone who's listening to us today, either live right now or after the fact. Our COVID-19 and higher education series is just beginning. Join us this Tuesday at the same time, 2 p.m. UTC, for research presentations from Dr. Singh, Dr. Shinga Moyo, and Mr. Kronke. Let's keep the conversation going. We invite you to follow Leaders of Africa and the Leaders of Africa Institute on Facebook and LinkedIn, as well as at Leaders Africa on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, join our Discord community for chat and networking and hit that subscribe button here on YouTube to receive all updates about new content from Leaders of Africa and the Leaders of Africa Institute. That's all from us today on Leaders of Africa Live. Until next time. <laughs>